Hello everyone. I'm here to discuss the most important current affairs of today from UPSC point of view. Today's articles have been sourced from The Hindu, The Indian Express and PIB with a special reference to the science and technology column of today's The Hindu. So without a further ado, let's begin. Our first article mentions that researchers at the University of Washington have developed a method that uses a smartphone derived images to visually identify bacteria on the skin and in the mouth to enhance the smartphone camera they attached a 3d printed ring containing 10 led black lights around the smartphone cases camera opening while the led lights excite the porphyrins which are found in hemoglobin and chlorophyll it causes them to emit red fluorescent signals that the smartphone camera can pick up using this method the team was able to generate a pseudo multispectral image consisting of 15 different sections of the visible light spectrum the pseudo multispectral images make it possible to clearly see the porphyrin clusters on the skin and in the mouth generally the more porphyrins you see on the skin surface the greater difficulty you see with wound healing as well as acne the team's approach can be tweaked to spot other bacterial signatures that also shine on the led to help identify potentially problematic bacteria in other medical contexts the next article is about dragon fruit export to dubai so in a major boost to export our exotic fruit a consignment of fiber and mineral rich dragon fruit which is also referred to as kamalam has been exported to dubai a consignment of dragon fruit for exports was sourced from the farmers of tadasar village Sangli district in Maharashtra scientifically referred to as Hylocereus sundatus the dragon fruit is grown in countries such as Malaysia Thailand the Philippines the USA and Vietnam at present dragon fruit is grown mostly in Karnataka Kerala Tamil Nadu Maharashtra Gujarat Odisha West Bengal Andhra Pradesh and the Andaman and Nicobar islands The cultivation requires less water and can be grown in various kinds of soils. There are three main varieties of dragon fruit: the white flesh with pink skin, the red flesh with pink skin, and the white flesh with yellow skin. The fruit contains fiber, vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants. It can help in repairing the cell damage caused by oxidative stress and reduce inflammation. and also improving the digestive system since the fruit has spikes and petals resemble lotus it is also referred to as kamalam this article talks about nasha mukt bharat abhiyan nmba the ministry of social justice and empowerment launched a website for the nasha mukt bharat abhiyan on the occasion of international day against drug abuse and illicit trafficking observed on 26th of june The day is observed worldwide to strengthen action and cooperation in achieving the goal of sustainable world free of substance abuse. The Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment is the nodal ministry for drug demand and reduction. It implements various programs for the drug abuse prevention across the country. The Nasha Mukt Bharat Abhiyan or a drug free India campaign was flagged off on 15th of August 2020. across 272 districts of the country found to be most vulnerable based on the data available from various resources the next article talks about experts and environmentalists opposing the decision of the uttarakhand government to open the jim corbett and the rajaji national park all year round you can refer to yesterday's current affair lesson the gist of the matter is that the uttarakhand government wants to open the national parks all year round but usually it is closed from june to november due to the monsoon monsoons are the breeding season for various animals and plants especially elephants opening the national park all year round can lead to man animal conflicts and hindrances in the process of mating the next article talks about vaccine hesitancy in rural area so people in the rural areas voice their concern about what will happen to them if they get vaccinated and have doubts 
that the government is sending inferior quality vaccines to them. In contrast, urban vaccination sites face increased demand, especially in the 18 to 45 group, and vaccine shortage is a major issue. The fear of vaccines and the issue of rural communities not only resisting but also outright rejecting vaccination is a reality. There have been several reports recently highlighting this. A few weeks ago, villagers in Barabanki jumped into a river to escape COVID-19 vaccinators. There are many diverse factors at play in this, which may go beyond the health concerns and have more to do with socio-anthropologic aspects of the health-seeking behaviour. Vaccine hesitancy is not a recent phenomenon. It is neither limited to a particular community or country, nor have we seen it only in the context of COVID-19. Various studies have shown that the acceptance of vaccines among African-American communities is relatively low in the US. Polls have also shown significant hesitancy among Hispanics and the people in rural areas in the US too. We have also seen vaccine hesitancy among the urban and the more educated or aware populations, with pockets of populations of socio-economically well-off communities refusing to get their kids vaccinated. The article points out that most of our fears and apprehensions stem from a deep impact of something adverse or unfavorable that we have personally experienced or our social circles have experienced. These individuals and the communities they belong to are probably not really challenging medical science or questioning vaccine trial results, adequacy or inadequacy of the evidence. Rather, they seem to indicate deep-seated fears and beliefs in conspiracies. The fear of perhaps being discriminated and deceived and of being omitted. Parts of rural Rajasthan where we have seen high vaccine refusal rates are also often poorly resourced and often tribal. A very strong feeling of distrust and resentment against the government institutions and those in power arises due to some past happenings. The underlying cause revolve around their feeling discriminated, betrayed and exploited. They have lived with the notion that their lives have little or no value. It is thus natural for them to look at everything new, especially adult vaccination efforts during a pandemic, with suspicion and have their guards up. So let us have a look at the issue. Vaccine hesitancy can be attributed to the fact that communities might not see the impact of vaccines instantly, as it's usually preventive in nature rather than curative. On the contrary, Vaccines administered to a healthy person may lead to occasional side effects like fever, body aches, etc. The rumours of calf serum in the vaccine also increase detest towards vaccine. Although we have seen in a previous video how the vaccine undergoes purification and why using calf serum was a necessary evil. So let us have a look at the way out. Addressing vaccine hesitancy in rural India would first of all require health systems to be honest and transparent. Health authorities need to be comfortable about people raising questions while providing them answers as best as possible. The government should also be cognizant of local cultural sensitivities and working with trusted intermediaries is important in this effort. Governments and health functionaries will need to rethink and alter their communication strategies and move beyond ceremonial awareness drives and campaigns to interventions that are truly engaging and which make the communities feel important and valued, engaging communities in planning, execution and monitoring of healthcare services at all levels. The government should create fora where they can freely convey what they want and how they want it to be delivered, where they can share how they feel about government policies, programs or services, where they can hold people and systems accountable for gaps without the fear of being subjugated. Government at both union and state levels must commit to investing more on healthcare and prioritizing primary healthcare services. The next article talks about 
multi drug resistance it refers to a microbe that is a bacteria fungi or a virus becoming resistant to multiple and known drugs against them over a period of time microorganisms can develop resistance mainly in two ways intrinsic resistance refers to the innate ability of an organism to resist a class of antimicrobial agents due to its inherent structural or functional characteristics acquired resistance refers to microorganisms acquiring the gene coding for resistance it's kind of like hacking except it's happening inside our bodies why do they develop resistance so overuse and misuse of antimicrobial agents is the single most important cause of development of resistance for instance when antibiotics are taken by people with viral infections like colds and flu they are also used indiscriminately as growth promoters in animals or used to prevent diseases in healthy animals poor infection control practices in hospitals in the hospitality sector and at home can cause the spread of disease fueling the high use of these drugs how to prevent the possible side effects always take antimicrobials when a doctor writes a physical prescription for you these are not over the counter drugs never self medicate or share medicines with family or friends use the prescription as your bible not a rough guide to meds so if it tells you to take it thrice a day do so the article goes on to talk about the fitness cost so let us read about it fitness cost means when bacteria becomes fit or adjusted in one environment they usually lose their ability to adjust to other environments A small populations acquire a certain set of mutations which allow them to survive in one environment while paying a cost in others large populations also develop these mutations but in addition have certain compensatory mutations that together give them the fitness to survive in different environments thus population size determines the kind of mutations available to the bacteria which in turn leads to the type of fitness costs they evolve the next article talks about the great barrier reef that is in danger so australia's great barrier reef with its diverse marine life ranging from corals to whales found a place on unesco's world heritage list in 1981 it is made up of a couple of thousands of individual reefs of the continent's northeastern coast The GBR is about 2 lakh 30 thousand kilometers long and extends across a breathtaking 3 lakh 46 thousand square kilometer area. It can be seen from outer space and is the world's biggest single structure made by living organisms. So the World Heritage Committee has sounded a warning by drawing up a resolution to inscribe the reef on the list of world heritage in danger. The 2019 Outlook report of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority said in no uncertain terms that the long-term state of the ecosystem has further deteriorated from poor to very poor. At the heart of this crisis is climate change, which has led to three big events of coral bleaching in 2016, 17, and 2020. UNESCO's move to list the GBR as in danger brings pressure on Australia's government as a continent that has recorded a rise in its average temperature by 1.4 degrees celsius since 1910 the devastating forest fires of 2019-20 for another wake up call on climate change aggravating extreme events so this is the great barrier reef on the map of australia you can see that it lies on the northeastern coast of the continent So the reef structure is composed of and built by billions of tiny organisms known as coral polyps. They are made up of genetically identical organisms called polyps, which are tiny, soft-bodied organisms. At their base is a hard, protective limestone skeleton called a callicle, which forms the structure of coral reefs. These polyps have microscopic algae. called zooxanthellae 
living within these tissues. The corals and algae have a mutualistic, that is a symbiotic relationship. Let us read about the threats to corals. Coral have been killed by rising sea temperatures linked to climate change, leaving behind a skeletal remains in a process known as coral bleaching. When corals face a stress by changes in conditions such as temperature, light or nutrients, they expel the symbiotic algae zooxanthellae living in their tissues, causing them to turn completely white. This phenomenon is known as coral bleaching. Corals can recover if the stress caused bleaching is not severe. Coral bleaching has occurred in the Caribbean, Indian and Pacific Oceans on a regular basis. Overfishing that can alter food web structure and cause cascading effects such as reducing the number of grazing fishes that keep corals clean of algal overgrowth. Coral harvesting for the aquarium trade, jewellery and curious can lead to overharvesting of specific species, destruction of reef habitat and reduced biodiversity. Let us look at the importance of corals. It is an integral part of marine ecosystem with plethora of species dependent directly or indirectly on it for food, shelter and breeding. More than 500 million people worldwide depend on reefs for food, jobs and coastal defence. The ridges in coral reefs act as barriers and can reduce wave energy up to 97%, providing crucial protection from threats such as tsunamis. Extracts from animals and plants living on reefs have been used to develop treatments for asthma, arthritis, cancer and heart disease. Problems with coral bleaching and global warming Warmer temperatures led to feminization of green turtles originating from nesting beaches in the northern region, potentially leading to significant scarcity or absence of adult males in the future. Coral growth is also endangered by the proliferation of crown of thorns starfish, which consumes them. The starfish population has shot up as predators declined due to overfishing. What is a coral triangle? That coral triangle is a coral-rich marine region in the Southeast Asia that encompasses the water bodies between Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines and Papua New Guinea. It's the most biologically diverse marine ecosystem on Earth. So this is the image of a coral triangle. The next article in the Indian Express talks about the IMF. It is in news since it has sought to increase the emergency reserves to $650 billion, which currently stand at $250 billion. So the International Monetary Fund is an organization of 189 members. It was conceived at a UN conference in Bretton Woods along with the World Bank. So IMF and World Bank are known as Bretton Woods Twins. Any other state, whether or not a member of the United Nations, may become a member of the IMF in accordance with IMF Articles of Agreement and terms prescribed by the Board of Governors. Membership in the IMF is a prerequisite to membership in the IBRD, which is the World Bank. On joining the IMF, each member country contributes a certain sum of money called the quota subscription, which is based on the country's wealth and economic performance. It is a weighted average of the GDP, openness, economic variability, and international reserves. Let us read about the special drawing rights in the IMF. It is the IMF's unit of account and not a currency. The currency value of the SDR is determined by summing the values in US dollars based on market exchange rates of a SDR basket of currencies. The SDR basket of currencies include the US dollar, Euro, Japanese yen, pound sterling and the Chinese renminbi which was included in 2016. The SDR currency value is calculated daily and the valuation basket is reviewed and adjusted every 5 years. The quotas are denominated in SDRs. SDRs represent a claim to currency held by the IMF member countries for which they may be exchanged. Members' voting power is related directly to their quotas, that is the amount of money they contribute to the institution. Let us read about the IMF quota. A member can borrow up to 200% of its quota annually and 600% cumulatively. However, access may be higher in exceptional circumstances. IMF quota simply means more voting rights and borrowing permissions under the IMF. But it is unfortunate that IMF's quotas formula is designed in such a way that USA itself has 17.7% quota, which is higher than cumulative of several countries. 
the G7 group contains more than 40% quota, whereas countries like India and Russia have only 2.5% quota in the IMF. Due to this discontent with the IMF, BRICS countries established a new organization called BRICS Bank to reduce the dominance of IMF or World Bank and to consolidate their position in the world as BRICS countries account for one-fifth of the world GDP and two-fifths of the world population. Let us have a look at this question from Prelims 2020. The gold tranche or the reserve tranche refers to So the options are a loan system of the World Bank, one of the operations of the central bank, a credit system guaranteed by WTO to its members, or a credit system granted by IMF to its members. The correct answer is option D. Let us have a look at what gold tranche or reserve tranche actually means. So the reserve tranche or the gold tranche is the component of a member country's quota with the IMF that is in the form of gold or foreign currency. For any member country, out of the total quota, 25% should be paid in the form of foreign currency or gold. Hence, this is called a reserve tranche or a gold tranche. The remaining 25% can be in domestic currencies and it is called credit tranche. So that's all for today from my side. Do write in the comment sections if you have any query regarding a particular topic. And do not forget to subscribe my channel. Thank you so much.